In this movie brew, we're going to talk about George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, starring Dwayne Jones as Ben, Judith O'Day as Barbara, Russell Striner as Johnny, Carl Hardman as Harry Cooper, Marilyn Eastman as Helen Cooper, Keith Wayne as Tom, Judith Riley as Judy, and Kira Schoen as Karen Cooper. While attending Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, George Romero started down the path of his film career, starting with directing and producing television commercials and industrial films for the latent image during the 1960s, a company he co-founded with his friends John Russo and Russell Striner. The three of them eventually got bored of making commercials and wanted to make a horror movie, wanting to capitalize on the film industry's thirst for the bizarre, according to Romero. Romero and Striner contacted Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman of Pittsburgh-based Hardman Associates Incorporated. They pitched their untitled horror film idea and a production company consisting of Romero, Russo, Striner, Hardman, Eastman, and five others was formed called Image 10. The initial budget for the film was $6,000, with each member of Image 10 putting up $600 for a share of the profits. Ten more investors were later found when another $6,000 was needed, but they were still short of what they would ultimately need. However, Image 10 eventually raised $114,000 for the film's budget. Russo and Romero started co-writing a horror comedy titled Monster Flick. One early draft had adolescent aliens <laughs> visiting Earth and befriending human teenagers. The next script had a young man running away from home and discovering rotting human corpses that aliens used for food scattered across a nearby meadow. Russo came up with the idea that they would only be recently dead because they couldn't afford to bring long dead people out of their graves. Russo also came up with the idea that they would be flesh eaters. A final draft primarily written by Russo focused on reanimated human corpses, Romero called them ghouls, not zombies, that would consume the living flesh. In 1997, during the BBC's Forbidden Weekend, Romero explained how the script developed into a three-part short story. Part one became Night of the Living Dead, while parts two and three became Dawn and Day of the Dead, respectively. Romero drew heavy inspirations from Richard Matheson's I Am Legend novel, I'll use Romero's explanation here. I had written a short story which I basically had ripped off from Richard Matheson novel called I Am Legend. I thought I Am Legend was about revolution. I said if you're going to do something about revolution, you should start at the beginning. I mean, Richard starts his book with one man left. Everybody in the world has become a vampire. I said we gotta start at the beginning and tweak it up a little bit, but I couldn't use vampires because he did. So I wanted something that would be an earth-shaking change. Something that was forever. Something that was really at the heart of it. I said, so what if the dead stop staying dead? And the stories are about how people respond or fail to respond to this. That's really all the zombies ever represented to me. Matheson wasn't impressed with Romero's interpretation, stating it was kind of cornball, though he admits Romero is a nice guy and he doesn't have any animosity towards him. There were changes being made to the script even by the time filming started. Carl Hardman stated that edits were being made due to Dwayne Jones' casting, as originally Ben was written as a truck driver who was lower class or somewhat uneducated, but Dwayne Jones, who was well-educated, didn't really care for the dialogue and refused to do the role as it was written. Hardman stated Jones changed up the dialogue himself to reflect how he thought the character would present himself in the situation. Marilyn Eastman made some modifications to the cellar scene's dialogue between the Coopers, and according to Judith O'Day, much of the dialogue in the film was improvised. She uses the scene where Barbara is telling Ben of Johnny's fate as an example, stating they would go over what had to be done and let the actors use that to improv their dialogue. Ironically, speaking of the script, while the film is often cited as being one of, if not the film, to launch the modern zombie movie, the word is never used in the film. Romero said he felt the undead in the film were different enough from Haitian zombies that he actively avoided using the term. Shooting for the film was very much dictated by the small budget, so scenes were filmed in Evans City, Pennsylvania, with the opening shot in the Evans City Cemetery. Jump ahead to modern times and the cemetery chapel that was seen in the movie was to be demolished. But in 2011, Gary Striner, an Image 10 investor and sound engineer on the film, started a movement to restore and preserve the chapel, citing that the cemetery is a major landmark for the film. I've been to the cemetery, and it's nothing short of amazing to be able to look around and see exactly where the opening of the film was shot. The farmhouse was located northeast of Evans City, near a park, and as it was scheduled for demolition, the film crew was allowed to damage the structure during filming. Sadly, the house was torn down, and the site is now just a turf farm. Tom Savini was originally supposed to work on the film's practical effects, but before filming began he was drafted into Vietnam where he was a combat photographer. The effects for the film were pretty simple with Bosco chocolate syrup used as blood and the flesh being consumed was roasted ham and entrails donated by one of the actors who owned a butcher shop chain. Costumes consisted of secondhand clothing from cast members and Goodwill stores. White skin and blackened eyes were used near the beginning of filming for zombie makeup with mortician's wax used to make wounds and decaying flesh as the film progressed. However, filming was not linear, 
so it's kind of mixed up where you see the more complicated zombie makeup. Romero shot on 35mm black and white film due to the budget, and ultimately the film benefited from this, as it comes across as almost like archive newsreel footage. Distribution was a problem as companies like Columbia Pictures and American International Pictures passed on the final film because Romero refused to soften it and reshoot the finale. Romero admitted they couldn't imagine a happy ending and the studios wanted a Hollywood ending, but ultimately Romero and the company stuck to their guns on this issue. Finally, Manhattan-based Walter Reed organization agreed to show the film uncensored, but the title was changed from Night of the Flesh Eaters to Night of the Living Dead. After the title change, the copyright notice was accidentally deleted from the early releases of the film causing problems and headaches for Romero for years to come. Essentially, the film was unintentionally dropped into the public domain, and this has led to numerous releases, modifications, and even a few colorized versions of the film, surprisingly not done by Ted Turner. The Museum of Modern Art and the Film Foundation used the original camera negatives and audio tracks to complete a 4K restoration of the film, and I'm torn on this. I feel like some movies should be left as is because part of their history and charm is how they look. To me, a film like this, or say Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, should look a little gritty and not like some polished Hollywood blockbuster. However, I would like to see the 4K restoration. The film opens with Barbara and Johnny driving to rural Pennsylvania to visit their father's grave. While in the cemetery, Barbara is attacked by a strange man and Johnny tries to help her, but the man throws him against a gravestone, killing him when his head hits the stone. After crashing her car, Barbara escapes on foot with the stranger in pursuit, arriving at a farmhouse. She discovers a woman's mangled corpse upstairs, causing her to flee from the house. However, she is confronted by more people like the man from the cemetery. Ben arrives and takes her into the house where he barricades the doors and windows and finds a rifle and a radio. The house isn't as abandoned as once thought though as Harry and Helen Cooper along with their daughter Karen and a young couple, Tom and Judy, are found to be in the basement. It's also revealed that Karen is ill after being bitten. While upstairs, Ben turns the radio on and Harry demands they all hide in the cellar. But Ben doesn't like the plan feeling that the basement is a death trap and continues to work on barricading the house with Tom's help. Radio reports explain that people are being murdered all across the East Coast and that recently deceased bodies are coming back to life and eating the living. Scientists in the military haven't figured out a cause, though there is speculation from one scientist that radioactive contamination from a space probe that was blown up in the Earth's atmosphere may be the cause. Ben plans to get Karen to a medical center after hearing of local rescue centers offering refuge, but his truck needs refueled. Ben and Tom refuel the truck while Harry throws Maltovs from an upper window at the reanimated dead. Judy had also followed, fearing for Tom's safety. During the commotion, Ben sets a torch on the ground and in Tom's haste to fuel the truck up, he accidentally spills gasoline on the ground in the truck, which of course, ignites. What's the torch? Tom tries to drive the truck away from the pump, but it explodes, killing him and Judy. <laughs> Ben returns to the house to find that Harry has locked him out. He forces his way back in and beats the shit out of Harry for being a pussy. More news reports are playing and it is revealed that only a gunshot or a heavy blow to the head can kill the ghouls. They can also be burned. It is revealed that there is a group of armed men patrolling the countryside in an attempt to restore some semblance of order. Eventually the lights go out and the zombies break through the barricades. Harry takes Ben's rifle and threatens to shoot him, but Ben manages to get the gun off of Harry and shoots him. Harry stumbles into the cellar and collapses next to Karen, who has died from her illness. The dead try to take Helen and Barbara through the windows, but Helen manages to free herself and returns to the basement, only to find the reanimated Karen eating her father's corpse. Helen, in a complete state of shock, is then stabbed to death by Karen using a masonry trowel. Upstairs, Barbara sees her brother among the dead before she's carried away and devoured. Help! 
As more dead overrun the house, Ben makes a run for the cellar, only to find the reanimated corpse of Karen. He fights her off and locks himself in the basement, where he shoots the reanimated Harry and Helen. The following morning, Ben wakes to the sound of gunfire outside. Thinking it's safe, he leaves the basement and the posse outside mistakes him for one of the dead and shoots him in the forehead. Alright, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. Good shot. Okay, he's dead. Let's go get him. That's another one for the fire. The bodies are retrieved from the house and piled up in the yard and set ablaze. And that was Night of the Living Dead. And for 1968, holy fuck. I can see how this movie had the impact it did then, and even though it was tame by today's standards, in 1968 nobody saw anything like this. Kind of makes me wish I could go back to that time and experience this film for the first time then. I love this movie, as I do with all of Romero's dead movies, but let's be honest, it's not perfect. And while the themes hold up, some of the acting has not held up well over the years. But here's the thing though. This movie, more than any other dead movie Romero made, this film feels like it's happening. Despite the outlandish premise of the dead rising, this feels like a documentary of a real group of people and their reaction to the circumstances they've been put into. From the audience's perspective, Harry is an asshole, but he's not unbelievable in his actions. Barbara really doesn't really do anything in the movie, but after watching her brother get murdered right in front of her, it's not that much of a stretch that she would be a mess and descend into madness throughout the course of the film. The ending is not a happy ending, and I feel that works more in favor of making this movie have a sense of realism to it. This is a film that characters make mistakes. They aren't necessarily likable and do not come out on top in the end, but none of it feels inflated or ever blown. Tom accidentally spilling gas at the pump doesn't come across as stupid, it comes across as an honest mistake made by somebody who is in such a panic because he has to get this task done and done quickly or he could die. If there's one major criticism I can live with the characters in this movie is that Barbara falls down way too many fucking times when she's running from the zombie at the beginning of the film and basically single-handedly started the whole trope in the realm of horror. While it's hard to add to the discussion of a film like this because what can be said that hasn't been said before, this is a film that has been looked at, torn down, and dissected more times than I can count. People have made whole discussions based around the casting of Dwayne Jones being the first strong black lead in a horror movie and the death at the end being cited as a commentary on the civil rights movement of the 60s. In reality, according to most of the people involved with the film though, Dwayne Jones was just the best man for the job and the script was not written with Ben being black or white. If you call yourself a fan of horror or cinema in general, there's no way you've missed this movie. And if you have, hang your head in shame. Go pick up a copy. Chances are you can find a DVD copy at the very least in the dollar bin at Walmart or Target. This movie was groundbreaking for its time and even now, 50 years later, it's still a hallmark of unrelenting dread and terror. Night of the Living Dead holds a special place in my heart as it was a film that my friends and I bonded over years ago. And as a native to the greater Pittsburgh area, it gives me pride to know that I live in an area where a film that was culturally and historically significant enough to be added to the National Film Registry was made. Whether you have seen this movie or not, go watch it. You can't really go wrong with watching a flick like this. They're coming to get you, Barbara.